Likewise, in today's text, Jesus also warns clergy to beware of three sins, the desire of recognition and the love of money and hypocrisy. Welcome to Menachem United Methodist Church online service on Sunday, August the 1st, in the year of the Lord, 2021. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are glad that you are here with us today as we unite our hearts and minds to worship our Heavenly Father. May the Lord bless all of us throughout the worship service. Amen. We will begin the service with the call to worship, followed by two prayers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The risen Christ is with us. We are going to do two prayers in unison. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our opening hymn today is hymn number 61 in the United Methodist Hymnal, Come Thou Almighty King.
We have a special music today, a vocal duet by Charlie Sperry and Geraldine Vanji, a mother-daughter duet. They are going to sing a piece, actually medley, of uh, two songs, 10,000 Reasons and What a Beautiful Name. May the Lord bless all of us as we join their praise of our Heavenly King. The lesson today is coming from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. And in his teaching, he was saying, Jesus was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like personal greetings in the marketplaces and seats of honor in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows houses, and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive all the more condemnation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let me begin my sermon with a disclaimer. This morning's message is mainly for myself. I prepared the sermon mainly for myself. However, I also believe this message is relevant to all the clergy members. Therefore, I pray in view of God's mercy that all clergy take Jesus' warnings to us seriously, as I do. Thirty-some years ago, as I entered parish ministry, a wise counsel advised me 
to beware of three ministry killers. They are silver, sex, and sloth. Three S's beware of. Since then, I am very mindful of such dangers in ministry. Likewise, in today's text, Jesus also warns clergy to beware of three sins, the desire of recognition and the love of money and hypocrisy. When you read the Bible, sometimes you feel that the words are jumping out of the page and directly speaking to you. And that's how I felt one day as I was reading today's text. I felt Jesus was directly speaking to me, warning me of three things, three dangers lurking in the path to faithful ministry. Beware, he commanded me, of the three sins that I, as pastor, can easily commit without knowing or realizing. They are the sin of the big me, the sin of the love of money, and the sin of hypocrisy. Jesus' warnings to religious leaders actually appear three times in the New Testament. In the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 23, Mark chapter 12, and Luke chapter 20. Matthew chapter 23, in particular, details Jesus' skating warnings to then the religious leaders, scribes, and the Pharisees. In the same chapter, seven times Jesus declared, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Same order. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Now please note here, Jesus seldom used such strong words of condemnation to anyone else but these two groups. Only once I can remember, he mentioned woe to an individual whose name was Judas Iscariot, by the way, who betrayed his master. Jesus never said woe to you toward ordinary folks. But the religious leaders was a different matter. He held them accountable in a you know better than that tone. Okay? Now, you would be actually shocked to know that Jesus actually called the scribes and Pharisees children of hell, saying, You snakes, brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? Matthew twenty three thirty three. Phew. No one wants to fall into such a strong condemnation from Jesus. Why was Jesus so harsh? Why these particular groups? By the way, scribes and Pharisees are equal to modern-day clergy, mind you. What made Jesus so strong against these two groups? Now, please keep in mind, Jesus was and is never against any individuals per se. Rather, he was always against the sins they have committed. I'm sure you've heard the expression before, God hates sin but loves sinners. The same goes with scribes and Pharisees. By the way, it would be helpful for us to understand the meaning of the word woe, W-O-E. I quote, it is often used to express grief, regret, misfortune, or grievous distress, that an escape out of it seems impossible. Hmm. No matter how we may understand it, we know that it's a bad word, and we don't want to hear that word from Jesus, right? Who are the scribes and Pharisees? Here's for your information. Scribes, I quote, were the scholars of the oral and written law of Moses, known to us as Torah in the Old Testament, 
and the instructor, they were the instructors and interpreters of it. And they preserved the scriptures by copying it carefully and meticulously by their hand. Are you with me? They are the scribes. What about the Pharisees? They were, I quote, a prominent religious sect of Judaism in the first century AD, and they were not of priestly descent. They were not priests, you know, like Levites. But they were strict observers of the law in its smallest detail. As scholars of the law and the traditions, they had great authority over the people. This is very important for us to understand today's text, why Jesus was so harsh against them. They were the teachers. Now, every village, every town had at least one scribe, and both scribes and the Pharisees were well-known experts on the law of Moses, Torah, and therefore partial overlap of membership of two groups happened. In other words, one scribe, also the Pharisee, the one Pharisee also happened to be the scribe, and so forth. Not all of them, but overlap was possible. All right. Let's talk about three sins Jesus warned against. The first sin Jesus condemned was the sin of, of loving human recognition. It is obvious that scribes and the Pharisees back then in the first century loved to be recognized by the people in the community. They were indeed respected and honored by the members of the synagogues. And for instance, they were invited to the place of honor at banquets. Whenever they had a huge gathering banquet, they were always, you know, invited to sit, the honor seat, guest honor. And also the best seats in the synagogues. Obviously, in those days, synagogues, they have a good seat and best seat and not so great seat. And they don't even give you the seat, you know, to sit down. You have to stand. Now, these people, religious leaders, also showed up their broad phylacteries. What are the phylacteries? Phylacteries is like a small box in a cube that you wear uh, just around your forehead in which you are supposed to keep the scripture verse, okay? So that you would never forget the scripture verse. Phylacteries, and they made bigger and the broad phylacteries. And they're long fringes. You know, if you think of the Jewish uh, folks wearing the prayer shawl and all along the edge, okay, they always have fringes and their fringes longer and longer. I think the longer it was, the people would reveal, just uh, uh, esteem you and say, wow, this man is very godly. You see? They did all things, Jesus says, to be seen by others and they would sit high, quote unquote, on Moses seat. Remember, they were highly esteemed by the people and had authority over ordinary folks. So Jesus warned them, I quote, that which is highly esteemed among people is detestable in the sight of God. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Here's a question for all of us. If such love of human recognition and practice thereof among religious leaders in the first century were bad, has it changed since? Are the clergy today in America doing any better than our counterparts in the first century? Well, it all depends on whom you're asking. My honest answer, for one, is that we are no better than scribes and Pharisees. Many clergy still love to be recognized and honored by the church members, but the question is, are they, the clergy members, truly representing Christ in their words and deeds as much as they are esteemed by the church? Beware of the temptation of big me. The second sin of clergy is the love of money. Now, one day Jesus was giving a lesson to the people around him, saying that no one can serve two masters. Either you hate one master and love the other and vice versa, but you cannot 
love two masters and serve two masters. And Jesus concludes, therefore, you cannot serve God and wealth at the same time. Hmm. You heard of that story. Now, the Pharisees, they were around and they were listening to Jesus. And uh, this is what Luke chapter 16, verses 14 and 15 says. Now, the Pharisees, who are lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were ridiculing him. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people, but God knows your hearts. You see, the Word of God clearly points out that anyone who desires to be bishop in the church must not be the lover of money nor greedy. That means even in the first century, there were church leaders who were greedy or in the love of money. And Jesus strongly condemned then religious leaders for devouring up the houses of widows. Hard to imagine, but obviously it must have happened. And that was a big problem back then. I think it still would be in the 21st century. Now, many years ago, I remember hearing a pastor giving a piece of advice to young pastors. He was about to retire, and this is what he said. I quote, if you love money, ministry is not for you. Hmm. I still remember that advice. The love of money and ministry do not go well with each other. Now, sometimes... The love of money snakes in and sets in the heart of clergy due to their low income. It has changed for good now, but in the past, many clergy and their families used to live on one income, and church housing we call parsonage. Nowadays, many clergy families have two incomes, and some clergy even own their own houses. It used to be forbidden by church law for clergy to own their house, no. Now, my family learned from the early years to live on with one income, and we are used to it by now. But one thing I never want to be is this, be in the love of money. Didn't the scripture also say that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil? not just for clergy, but for all people. So folks, pray that your pastor never falls into this sin, the love of money. The last sin of clergy Jesus condemns is hypocrisy. Speaking of hypocrisy, Jesus attacked the practice of scribes and Pharisees who would religiously clean the outside of the cup and outside of the plate back then, yet their inside was full of greed and self-indulgence. You know, they really religiously practice when after you come home, after visit to the marketplace, for example, you must wash your hands up to the wrist, okay, very thoroughly and hands and plates and cups and whatnot. But inside, Jesus says, you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Jesus condemned back then and still does today such a lifestyle where inside is full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, while outside looks perfectly sincere and even godly. Here's the reality. No one is immune to hypocrisy. And all of us are prone to hypocrisy to a certain degree. I am prone to it too. But clergy must be very careful with it because we, the clergy, tend to do a lot of things for appearances' sake in order to please the crowd. We tend to offer, for example, long prayers with impressive words. Now, according to Jesus, such practice and those prayers, we get plenty of human recognition from people, yet that means no reward whatsoever from God in heaven. And one more thing and I'll be through. Please reason with me. 
for the root of hypocrisy. If you dig deeper and deeper and just go down all the way to the root of the hypocrisy, what would you see? This is what I would see. For the appearance's sake, to be recognized by people, to be commended and praised by people, and to justify self before people. Hypocrisy stems from the desire to be recognized and loved and justified and praised by people. I know one remedy for such hypocrisy, that is to learn to desire the divine recognition only. Let me share with you my personal testimony. I was in Michigan 30 years ago. I was serving a small rural congregation. The membership is about you know, 70. And one day, Oh, by the way, I was just out of, uh, fresh out of the seminary back then. I was in my 30s, okay? Much younger than I am now. One afternoon, I was coming home after visiting with the one senior member. Her name was Bertha. She was 92 years old lady with hearing problems. The time and date that I was visiting with her, she was not wearing her hearing aid. So you could imagine for the next two hours, I said one thing, she says, what did you say? What did you say? Now, it would make you nervous if the person you're talking to keeps asking, what did you say? What did you say? I'm sorry. And that's how I spent the two hours with her. Anyway, at the end of the visit, we, I prayed and, you know, we said goodbye and so forth. So I was driving home. It took about 45 minutes. And I was thinking about myself and my life. Basically, the question you know, I was struggling with was this. What am I doing in this nowhere <laughs> boondock in Michigan? I'm young. I'm ready to turn the world upside down with the gospel message. I deserve better than this. I felt I had wasted my time in prayer. On that very moment, folks, the Lord spoke to me in my heart. Not audibly, but you could tell it was He. He said, you have seen me today. You have visited with me this afternoon. I was shocked. And the good Lord also reminded me and gave me the verse that day, Matthew 25, 40. This is how it says, the king will answer and say to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Jesus said to me, Today you have seen me. And I repented, folks. That's it. I don't care what the world think of me, how big or how small. All I care is what? The Lord recognized my service. That's it. And since that time, Matthew 25, 40 became my ministry motto. Whatever you do to the ones who believe in me, you have done to me. As for closing, I will say this. People in the church are very kind and respectful of me as clergy. For that I am very grateful. However, I better not forget that I am no better than laity. I better not be self-considered. The reason why they show respect and love for me is not because I am better than they are, but because of Christ whom I represent. Jesus is the focus, not me. That will help me stay humble. That will help me stay focused on the Lord. That will help me stay alert against sins that Christ condemns. Pray also for all clergy that they may not commit the sin of big me. Pray that they never love money and pray that they remain forever sincere and humble before God and people. Amen. Today is Communion Sunday.
We are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And we'll begin with a great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them before us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you and me. This is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you and me. Let us take the Lord's Supper with gratitude and faith. Let us bow us and pray one more time. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's time for joys, concerns, and praises. Uh, concerns first. Your continued prayers for our nation and global leadership always appreciated. Okay, it is a biblical mandate for us to keep our leaders and those in authority in our prayers. Also, continued prayers for our members and friends who need our prayer support uh, for their health and financial recovery and restoration of relationships. A little update on our members. The first one is Lucy May. Uh, she is the great-granddaughter of uh, Dorothy Haddon. 
She's just one year old baby, but she's expecting to have a surgery on her brain uh, sometime in mid-August. So please keep uh, Lucy May and her family in your prayers that the surgery would be successful. Continued prayers for Warner Schmidt, who's still recovering from shingles, and also Anne Scatoro. Also, it's time for Joyce. First of all, last Sunday we had two visitors, Rick and Louise Jones, former members of this congregation. Now they're living in Florida, but they are visiting with us uh, in this area for a week. It was very nice to see uh, our good old friends. Thanks, Rick and Louise. The second, last Sunday, one of our members, uh, Eva Mueller, was showing me a huge snake gourd that was grown in our church garden. Now, nobody seems to know what to do with it, either how to cook it. So I ended up taking it home, and we were able to cook it. But before I took it home, Eva uh, was having fun with the gourd, pretending that she was blowing either a French horn or a tuba. Anyway, thanks, Eva, for your fun spirit. The last one is more like a personal uh, joy. You know, we have a little backyard in the, um, at the parsonage, and um, I feel like God is putting on a, a nature display or show every day uh, through all these creatures, beginning with the birds and squirrels. They're pesky at times. <laughs> One of the things they do to our flower garden is that you keep constantly digging the roots of the flowers and you know, throwing the dirt out of it. I think they're having fun just doing that. Anyway, they are, however, most of the time they're just uh, very delightful creatures to look at. Yesterday I saw a hummingbird flying to the flowers, you know, in the uh, backyard. It was so delightful to see that. And this morning I saw a bunny uh, munching some, you know, just uh, apples on the ground. And uh, each time I look at all these uh, creatures of God, I thank God for such a beauty and variety of His creation. So thank you. Well, that's for now. And uh, let us bow as and pray one more time. Lord, we lift up our national leadership, global leadership, as they continue to uh, doing their work uh, for their people, never for their own sake, but the sake of others and their benefits. Be with them and give them guidance as well as wisdom and courage to do what is right before your sight. Okay, Lord, and uh, we pray also for our members, Lucy May, and some of our members are going through some um, health challenges as well as uh, financial struggles. And we also pray for the restoration of relationships, all in due time, according to your will and according to your power. And once again, Lord, we give thanks to you for this wonderful congregation where everyone is precious in your sight. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for the offerings and tithes. Once again, I sincerely thank you for your partnership for God's kingdom work at our church and beyond. Without your help and financial support and prayers, we cannot carry on God's work here. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. For those who would like to support uh, our church, the information is posted here. And let us bow as and pray one more time. Lord, we give this offering back to you as a token of our appreciation. Use this offering for your glory and honor and help us never waste your offerings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 671, Lord, Dismiss Us With Thy Blessing.
Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.